Holy smokes, guys. I think I just drilled the big one. Oh, yes. Yes, that is the deer. Got piles of pictures of that here. Oh, that is a beautiful buck. That happened quick. Holy man, that looked like a really good bull. Pound it, man. Yes. Subscribe to the Non-Typical Nation podcast and keep up with the team on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at nontypical.org. Awesome, guys. Well, welcome back to another Non-Typical Nation podcast. Today, I'm with Aaron Stonehawker with Tacticam. Uh, this has been a long time coming here, Aaron. We've scheduled it a few times. We've both just had a bunch of stuff going on each time and we couldn't make it work, but I'm absolutely thrilled that I got you here today and uh, yeah, I can sit down, pick your brain a little bit on some of Tacticam's products, uh, get to know you, let our audience get to know you as well. And um, yeah, so here's the introduction, guys. This is Aaron with Tacticam. I guess to get started, Aaron, what exactly is your role at Tacticam? And uh, you're on the American side of things, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my role is uh, current role as brand manager. I've played several different roles at the company. So uh, basically, I oversee our conservation support programs and our uh, content creation programs, so working with partners like you guys. It's the, basically the nuts and bolts about what I do. But uh, we're a, a fast growing marketing department. So this role could probably take a few different turns here in the next year or two. But that's what I do. Well, you got a fun gig. Deal with all the, the conservation side of things. Deal with, you know, the different brands that that promote and work with you guys. Um, Tacticam, it's grown quite rapidly over the last decade or so. Or how long has Tacticam been around for now? Tacticam, uh, as, a, as a business, has basically been around for about a decade is what we, we kind of say. Um Probably about two and a half to three years in is when it got pretty serious. And then the current uh, ownership structure uh, came together and, and was in place. And I've been with the company going on seven years now. So wow. um, actually, fun fact, I'm the longest tenured employee that Tacticam has right now, which is kind of a neat little thing to have, I guess. But uh, yeah, man, we have uh, we started with the uh, point of view cameras. You know, share your hunt is what we're all about. And started with a guy with a cool idea about, man, you know, there really aren't any Super easy, compact little cameras that work great for just filming my hunt out of a Wisconsin tree stand. So, yeah, um, yeah. using technology and know-how way way above my head, he developed the first little camera, duct taped it together, and taped it to his bow. And then now we have the Tacticam 6.0 that just launched. So that's right, uh, super <laughs> cool, man. So you've been with the company for seven years, so you've really seen them grow from essentially not necessarily the very start, but pretty darn close. Um, yeah, yeah. So the the Tacticam 6.0, that's your most recent um, point of view style camera that you guys have on the market today. Was there one as early as a 1.0, 2.0, 3.0? So are we at sort of the sixth generation of this initial point of view camera that Tacticam's released? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'd, I'd say the first camera and uh, Ben Stern, the founder of Tacticam, he, he still has a, a lens with a microchip a little uh, buzz motor and a button and a watch battery all duct taped together. So that's wow. probably like the 0.5 model. But then, uh, yeah, it had a housing and essentially it was just called Tacticam, basically the 1.0. Um, I jump, jumped in as the company. I, I write for a few different outdoors magazines, um, the Iowa Sportsman uh, being one of them. And uh, they were just started advertising Tacticam. And so I was talking to the editor. He told me about it. And they had the 2.0 out. And that was probably their first like really serious camera. Um, had a nice sleek design, had the logo stamped on the side. Um, and that's really what became like the staple or kind of the framework, I guess, for every tax cam that's came out since. So we had the 2.0, which was a metal housed camera. And then we kind of had our first really big technology jump with the 3 and the 4.0. And I was probably two years into that. Um, and the 3 and the 4 launched simultaneously. Uh, basically, it was the first time we had a chip that could do the Wi-Fi signal, so you can connect your okay. camera to your phone. And the 3.0 didn't have the Wi-Fi. The 4.0 did, but we got you know five times zoom at that time, um, some slow motion modes in there, um, high resolution, better resolution settings in there as well. So kind of the first technology jump, but really we were testing the waters to see, you know, is connectivity for our customers really important? Is that something they want? And ultimately, the 4.0 sold like four or five to one over the three. So they customers told us Wi-Fi was important. 
And every generation since then, the five and the six, our fisheye camera, our spotter, our spotting scope camera, all of them have the Wi-Fi connectivity. So out in the field, you can connect to your phone and share your hunt, you know, right there or review shots, you know, replay stuff, that kind of stuff. Super, super cool. <laughs> um, you know, myself, so I didn't necessarily grow up in a, in a hunting family. Um, I started hunting, actually, funny story. Um, so my grandfather was a taxidermist. So every summer I'd go to the taxidermy shop and just enthralled with all the animals. But he wasn't a real serious hunter. He did some duck hunting, but that was about it. Um, my dad knew that I, I, I liked hunting. I wanted to get into it. Every Sunday I'd watch hunting on television. Every you know weekend, first chance I had, turn the TV on and I'm watching deer hunting or fishing or whatever. And so he actually sent me away with one of his friends when I was like 11 years old and I didn't know the guy. My mom didn't know the guy. She, you know, was kind of frustrated that he just sent me away with some random guy that he knew from work to go hunting. And so I was 11 years old and, you know, we're pushing bush in Saskatchewan. I think one guy shoots a deer and then we walk into a little bluff and I remember it just clear as day. And there's this deer standing right in front of us. One antler's broken off and it's got like four little points. And there's me, 11 years old, just, you know, small. I'm wearing, I think, like white long johns that I just pulled over ski pants. And the guys are like, just wear white. You need an orange vest. We'll get you an orange vest. And, you know, I'm 11 years old with these like 40, 50 year old men. And um, he's like, do you want to shoot it? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And so he hands me his 300 Weatherby Magnum. <laughs> Sets it on the tripod. I'm like, I see it. He's like, you ready? I'm like, I'm ready. Boom. It knocks me right on the ground, essentially. The deer falls down and I got my first deer. Now, I was 11 years old and then, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, you're in high school and and I was living in a, a bigger city in Regina. So I really didn't do any hunting. Every summer I'd go fishing when I'd meet with my grandparents. But it wasn't until I was about 18 or 19 um, living on my own. And I'm like, you know, I want to get back into hunting. And so I, I hunted for a few years and just didn't have good success. And then in my early 20s, I moved up here to northern Alberta and I, I joined um, my grandfather in, in the taxidermy business here. And that's when I really got into taxidermy. So the big thing with me was I was out hunting at 21, 22 years old and experiencing all of these incredible moments, seeing bears and seeing all these deer and even just seeing a grouse or I, you know, I'm going grouse hunting and I see five or six and just to watch them, it was incredible. So then I started bringing a camera with me so I could share these moments with other people. And I remember like the early days is I would just get like a GoPro and yeah, you know, duct tape it to the the barrel of the gun or just goofy things right and then when i found out about tacticam i think it was 2016 or 17 was when i heard about them and so i bought one of the earlier models at that time and it was just so much nicer than messing around with you know a cheap little i don't even think i had a gopro because they were too expensive for me at that time just a, a cheap action camera the quality was horrific um, but that's sort of how I got into filming. And it's incredible just working with you guys the last few years. How many guys have had similar stories to that? They're like, hey, you know, I just started filming to share these stories and these videos and these experiences with my family, my friends. And then they're sending us this cool content. So it's really neat to see. And I'd imagine you guys just get a ton of that as well, because it, it seems like, like I said, Tacticam's just exploded over the last few years. You know, everyone I know up in, in Canada here, not everyone, but most guys, you know, know of Tacticam. They've used it. They have a camera. They got the trail camera, something along those lines. Um, so it's really exciting to see that, uh, you know, people are capturing these moments and that you guys are making it easy for them to do. Um, one thing I've always said is, is stories are cool. I love telling stories. It's great sitting down with guys who've hunted for 50, 60 years telling stories. But if they got a photo, that's even cooler because then you can see that photo. But if they have a video now, that is just, you know, that is the best, right? So <laughs> the way I look at it is, um, like I tell my wife and my kids is, hey, my grandkids can laugh at their crazy grandfather when they look at these videos 40, 50 years down the road, right? Because we've been 
filming everything now for the last, you know, seven or eight years. And, you know, we've filmed 50 or 50 plus different hunts and stuff. Um, we're starting to do more of the, the fishing uh, episodes as well now. So um, it's just cool stuff. You know, I, I love experiencing the wild, um, the fishing, the hunting. It's just a real passion of mine, but it's an equal passion of mine to capture this content and share it with people. So, you know, the Tacticam's made it easy for us. Obviously, we still run our camcorders and everything else, but the Tacticam on top of my bow or on the stabilizer just gives us another angle, another point of view for that, that viewer. But, you know, most guys aren't as serious into the filming as we are. So, you know, a simple Tacticam that's essentially smaller than my phone um, to film your hunts, you know, with a press of a button is, uh, it's it's revolutionary. You guys have really changed things. And, you know, we've been thrilled to work with you guys. So it's exciting to see and you guys are always innovating. And that's why I want to get you on this podcast, just to sort of pick your brain about the history of Tacticam, what's coming up in the future and whatnot. So, um, yeah, the Tacticam 6.0, you know, some some neat improvements from the 5.0, which was a great camera. But uh, one of the things I really like with that was that you have the screen. The Tacticam's tiny, but you put a screen right on that Tacticam. Um, you know, that must have been tricky trying to explain to the manufacturer or whoever's designing these that you want a screen on this little four inch camera. <laughs> yeah being totally transparent about it when it when i heard that the 6.0 was going to have a screen on it i was kind of like scratching my head like ah, wow. do we really want to do that and, and that's all we got told i was in the sales team at the time and oh hey the 6.0 is going to have this feature that feature oh and by the way it's going to have this touch screen on it. in in my head i'm thinking it's going to be this little fold out thing or who knows what you know but again like you said we've got a you know basically a three and a half inch camera that weighs three ounces and it's got it's a round cylinder like how are you going to throw a screen on this and so as you know, like the 6.0, they, they redesigned it a little bit. The top is now flat. And um, yeah, they got the screen. And I'll be the first guy to say that I was totally wrong and that I thought it wasn't going to be that big of a deal. But it is so cool having it there for that instant, you know, view viewability, being able to just swipe back and forth and change your modes has been, again, something I just so used to doing with the buttons over the years. I never even thought about it, but it's way easier I love that you can swipe up and you, it's a little small screen. So it's a little tougher to make out some things depending on what you just filmed, but you can replay right there on the screen without having to turn the Wi-Fi on and hook it up to your phone, which again, you just get so used to these things and how they work. And it's hard to think that this screen would make those things that much easier, but it's definitely a big, a big hit. And then really going back into the trade show circuit this year after COVID and everything else, it was, I forgot how many times we get asked by customers like, how do I know where this thing's looking? And as intuitive as it is, you know, as long as the button's straight up and down and you're pointing it, what your eyes are seeing is what the camera's seeing and telling somebody that normally you'd hook it up to your phone and show them, but now you're just like, hey, check out that screen. You can see. And the customer response has been outstanding as well. So definitely a cool improvement with the screen. Well, and that's that's the exact reason why I like the screen is because, you know, depending on the scenario of the camera and how I'm using it, I might adjust the zoom because you guys have a zoom on these cameras. So if I have it on my bow stabilizer and I'm, you know, expecting to send an arrow at something that's 20 or 30 yards away, I might not zoom in all the way, but I might zoom in about halfway. And that way yeah. on that screen, I can see sort of what I'm looking at um, because there really are a ton of different features on the camera and they're super adjustable. You know, you can just do your um, auto setting and that's going to get you good photo, but you can adjust so much on the phone as well. So on that screen, do you, you can adjust more on the phone, right? As per the, the custom settings and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So the camera, um, all the cameras that we make, the number one goal of Tacticam is to be like the easiest camera to use to film your home. Yeah. Like point blank period, right? So we always have to stay true to that. So on any of our cameras from the uh, basically the 3 or 4.0 up to now the 6.0, we preset the settings into three different modes. You've got your high resolution mode, which is basically fully backed out what your eye sees, what the camera sees, and our max resolution, which is now 4K. Um, then there's the zoom mode, which zooms you all the way in. Now it's an eight time zoom. Um, and then you have your slow motion mode. Once we came out again with three and the four, we put slow motion in there so customers can film slow motion really easily and know what they're filming. Um, but for the in 99% of our customers, it's probably close to 99% are blue collar guys, 
they're just like you said, they're the guy that's like finally like, hey, guy or gal, I'm going on this cool hunt, or maybe my kids are coming up and starting to hunt now. Let's go ahead and, and start filming, and, and here's the best camera for it. So all those preset modes are going to fit almost every single person out there. Going to be totally happy with one of those three modes when they're filming. For the guy like you that does TV and you know exactly like what you want out of a certain thing, or maybe there's a very specific frame rate, or like you said, a mid-level zoom that you want to achieve, or adjust your resolution settings. You can adjust everything you can basically on your your full blown exactly. camp yeah. through the app on a tactic cam. But most people aren't going to mess with it. But for the guys that are really tech savvy and want to mess with that, you can get so granular with it. It's kind of stupid. Yeah, no, that's great. And so um, the new ones film in 4K, which is absolutely incredible for a little point of view camera like that. Um, now, what's the price point on these new 6.0s? The price point uh, MSRP 329 uh, map retail, which is where you're going to find it most of the time is at 299. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's very, very good. Um, you know, any 4K camera is going to be action camera is going to be that price or more. But the fact that this is specifically designed with extra attachments to put on your bow, um, on your shoulder and all, you know, anywhere you want, essentially, and set right up for um, for hunting. Now, a cool feature, which we've really utilized, utilized is the remote. The fact yeah. that we can put a camera on the ground at the bear bait or, you know, at a turkey decoy where we think these birds are going to come in, um, a camera on our bow and then maybe one in the blind. We hit the remote with one button and all of them are filming. Super cool feature. Um, and you guys came out with that one a couple of years ago with a 5.0, right? Or was it yeah. further back than that? Well, the 5.0 was the first one that had the remote. Uh, and like you said, it's designed to be one of the five cameras. Five on the remote, five cameras fire up, start recording. And uh, yeah, it makes it super easy. And it's a lot more fun. Um, with the multiple angles having the remote, obviously, because you, like you said, you don't have to be right on top of it to, to run it. Um, but yeah, been, that's been huge. That one's compatible with um, the 5.0, the fisheye, the 6.0, and the new Solo Extreme. Sweet. So yeah, we really, well, I, so Troy, um, the other host of the show here, he does all of our turkey hunting in the spring. Um, I'm in Northern Alberta, so we're covered in bears. So we do all our bear hunting. And that's one that we really utilize at the bear bait is put a camera down there. I went through probably 16 or 17 days of hunting last spring, and it was on the second last hunt, and a bear actually drug my camera away. No kidding. And it got dark, and we did not find it. I was with an outfitter. I had to leave the next day. I called him, hey, have you found that tactic cam? He never did find it. Um, but uh, we got some pretty cool footage from that thing, so it was, you know... You got to weigh the, the advantage and disadvantage, but uh, nonetheless, we'll have some down at the bait this year, maybe try and find a better way to secure them. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's incredible. The, the, the view you can get of these animals up close and personal right on the ground. Um, yeah, no, they've been great. So now I want to just dive into uh, actually, there's a few other products I want to talk about uh, spotter LR FTS two items products. I've used a ton of the last couple of years, um, I want to talk about you and some hunts that you have going on, but let's talk about these two products because I don't want to forget the spotter LR, um, incredible, incredible. The amount of attachments this thing comes with, you can attach it to virtually 99% of the spotting scopes on the market. It has its own zoom. Um, it films 1080p this one, I believe it's 4K. it is 4k. There we go. It's 4k. So we went to Saskatchewan um twice this year this past year up here in northern alberta i haven't really had a chance to utilize a spotting scope you know we're hunting some pretty heavy timber up here occasionally you know we'll glass some cut blocks if they are you know half a kilometer or a kilometer long but uh, in saskatchewan we really put that spotter lr to work and captured some incredible um moose footage some deer footage you know what we were doing in september is we we're hunting the river valleys of the north saskatchewan river um i was hunting mule deer troy was hunting moose and mule deer and um you know essentially we would sit in these valleys and these deer would come up to the uh, up out of the valleys onto the fields to uh to eat i didn't end up killing a mule deer but the amount of moose that i filmed at the the very bottom of the river bottoms crossing the river with the spotter LR was incredible because, 
you know, our camcorders, we have about 20 times optical zoom, which is great, but I could reach out to something that was three, four kilometers away and get really good footage through that spotter LR. Now, you know, the quality of glass you have obviously makes a difference as well. But um, yeah, another really cool, cool product was the Spotter LR. I know you guys have had that one for a few years. And then the Tacticam FTS. That was the one that films through the scope. Um, my wife has filmed a few bear hunts with that one. She captured, you know, some incredible content three years ago where she, you know, had the scope on the bear the whole time it came down the tree she arrowed it and it went all the way up the tree and fell right down the video went like viral online we had to shut the comments off it was unreal like we were both in the tree stand just vibrating because we couldn't imagine couldn't believe what happened um again another reason why we like to film and then last year we were in saskatchewan hunting bears again and she arrowed just a, a beautiful big boar um, with the crossbow and she filmed it all through that scope um, so that'll be on TV in probably a few months here in Canada. And it'll also be on YouTube and as well. But um, yeah, you know, you guys are always, always revolutionizing. And the fact that, uh, you know, you can film whether you want to film something with uh, a Tacticam on your bow or through your scope or through your spotting scope, you guys have a product for that. You know, for a guy like you it's like you kind of mentioned earlier just it makes that second third angle uh so easy it's it's kind of ridiculous and then you have a guy like me who you know i work for the company and i uh but there isn't a single hunt that i don't bring two or three cameras on now because i can i started with one but i've worked my way up to two or three and on my rifle i'll have uh our clamp mount facing one right back at me so i get my reaction my wife's hunting now um i love seeing her reaction out in the field so i'm usually bringing a third angle to kind of film her just handheld but it doesn't matter what you're hunting or shooting with. You're going to get the shot on film. And it's like you said, through the scope, through your spotting scope, uh, off your bow riser, you know, however you're doing that shotgun, whatever. So it just makes it so easy. Yeah. So we filmed uh, our deer, a couple deer hunts in the year before last with the FTS system. And then, um, and then we got the two bear hunts with it. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it, it's incredible because you know, the viewers seeing what you're seeing through that scope and you don't sacrifice any quality at all. Um, so yeah, you know, two products, which we absolutely love and we'll definitely be putting to work uh, this spring for sure. We're excited. Yeah. Um, so yeah, coming up here, we're like rapidly approaching April. Um, we've got a few hunts planned in the spring. Do you do much for spring hunting? I do. So uh, we, my wife's active duty air force. So we actually kind of bounce around a little bit. Uh, both grew up in Iowa. So when, you know, growing up, when I got into hunting um, every year, spring turkey hunting, I usually did uh, one of the first two seasons and then season four, the weights broke down there. So we try to get two birds a year, which is cool. Um, and then we moved to Virginia was our first duty station together. Where that's where I got out of the Air Force. Um, and so spring turkey out there as well. Um, and then we moved to Montana and that's where I got my first taste of like what I consider like my favorite thing to do now, which is spring bear hunting. Haven't got one, but just being having a reason to get out there early spring. There's really no in Montana, maybe similar to you guys, there's really no like break in hunting season. You just kind of get this little lull or you're waiting for things just to warm up a little bit, but getting to go just hike around and see all the different things you get to see during spring bear is just so cool. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be missing that. We're actually uh, right now in the kind of our coordination of trying to get this podcast launched. My wife and I are moving from Montana to uh, Maryland for her to do a school program. So right back to, to Eastern Turkey hunting, but I tried to get up here um, at least one hunt a year. And then we had our first kiddo last year. So it was the first year we've been in Montana. I didn't go turkey hunting. Um, but uh, there's a gentleman that lives out on the eastern part of the state here. I try to make at least one trip out there every year. And um, But yeah, did, love turkey hunting, love spring bear hunting. I'll be missing the spring bear until we can come back out west sometime. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, nice thing with bears is fall bear hunting is incredible too. Um, we spend a we, we spend majority of our bear hunting in the spring that's usually when we do it and, and that just the the reason for that is once we get into fall you know we got deer we got moose elk there's so much other stuff going on and you're trying to cram it all into three months <laughs> um but uh yeah and you know nice thing with alberta is you got wolf and predator and coyote hunting in the you know the winter and then april 1st is when our bear hunting starts up here but the bears really don't get moving till about mid-April, 
I think the earliest we killed a bear was about April 13th, April 12th, but that was very early. We still have two, three feet of snow in the bush right now, and things are actually thawing quicker than usual. So I think it will be an early spring for us here. Um, but uh, yeah, so our our bear hunting will start, um, you know, we'll start getting our baits out in probably a couple weeks. And then we have uh, a hog hunt actually in Saskatchewan at the end of April. And then as soon as that's done, we'll be right into hunting our bears here and here in Alberta. But um, I know Troy in Manitoba, they have turkeys all over the place. I went hunting deer there last fall and they have turkeys in the fields like we have geese. And it, I just couldn't believe it how many there were in this this area. Um, they're just heavily concentrated and uh, you could almost walk right up to them. It was very strange. But he said in the spring, it's a little bit different. But uh, they say turkey hunting sort of like poor man's elk hunting because you can communicate with these birds. You know, they're all over the place, but they'll gobble back at you and you got to entice them to come in. I'd love to do it. The thing with turkey hunting in Canada, um, Ontario, I think it's opened up for non-residents. BC, you can hunt, but they don't have a lot of birds there. But Manitoba, they have it locked down. Only residents can hunt them in that province. Alberta here, we don't have many. We have a lottery tag for turkeys. Or no, sorry, it's a priority tag. And it usually takes between 13 and 16 priority points to hunt these birds in Alberta. So you got to travel um, a little ways down south and you got to wait quite a while to get a tag. And there just aren't many birds. So I haven't had a chance to hunt wild turkeys yet, but uh, hopefully soon. But bears are definitely something that we just love to hunt. You know, they're super fun to interact with. And we hunt them, you know, at baits. And then we also do the spot and stock thing. But um, yeah, at the baits, it's neat because you're within about 20, 25 yards from these bears and you'll often have several bears in the area. And sometimes, you know, they like to swat at your tree and it's just really neat to, to interact with them. But um, fall bear hunting's fun too, because fall, they're really gorging on those blueberries and berries and grasses. So they're really fat. The fur is actually much nicer in the fall. They don't have the thick under fluff, but they're consistently furred throughout. In the spring, you'll occasionally get bears where they're rubbed out because they'll rub out their winter fur. But uh, if you want a really big, big bear, um, fat bear, usually the fall bears are, you know, the bigger ones for sure. But um, yeah, no, man, we we love our bear hunting. And I, I got to gotta make it a priority, though, to, to squeeze some turkey hunting in one spring. So uh, we'll see. It won't be this spring, though. I know Troy's hitting them pretty hard. They always do just because they have so many birds around them there. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I've, I'd love to do it. You know, I've edited all their episodes and it just seems like so much fun. Um, now, when it comes to turkey hunting, do you usually hunt them with a bow or shotgun or what, what do you typically do? Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of both. It's primarily shotgun. Just uh, again, when I'm kind of cramming in on a timeline or I'm going to go out to eastern Montana or whatever for a weekend. Um, shotguns are most reliable i guess in terms of uh kind of knowing what you're getting into um but uh i've done it a bunch of different ways i've killed a couple with a bow um back in iowa growing up and then everything i've gotten since then has been shotgun uh but probably the most fun way i've done it and it's kind of one of those controversial things a little bit but tacticam at one point had a brand called turkey reapers um, that we had partnered with a gentleman on to kind of help him produce these turkey decoys that you like hide behind basically Okay. And you're trying to just get the bird fired up that he thinks you're coming to take his hands. Tom's come running in like they're going to beat you up and you smoke one at like five feet. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen, but that gets fun. And just the only uh, weird note I've seen is so Eastern turkeys in Iowa and then on the East coast, they're a lot more aggressive, I'd say, than what the Miriams are that we have out here. And the Miriam birds for the, all the ones I ever interacted with, they just never seem to really care that much about it. Interesting. Um, it's funny hearing you mention that, uh, the birds out in Manitoba, you can almost walk up to certain times of the year. The first year I, we moved here, I put in for the lottery tag for region four in Montana, which is where I live because the same concept. We have a couple concentrated populations, but not overall that many birds. And I actually drew the tag. It was like one of 12 people that drew the tag that year and uh, went out to um, this farm that I knew had some, and it was a block management. So I just signed in, went hunting. I was out there for like six hours messing with these birds, trying to get them to come in and get close, but they'd stay like 60 yards, like just out of my comfortable shotgun range. And uh, I ended up 
cr belly crawling in behind some sagebrush, shoot one at 40 yards. I kind of film what the birds do their thing. And when I stood up, like all the birds, there's probably 50 of them. They all just kind of came out and they were just standing there like 40 yards, like with the bird I just shot. Wow. And uh, wow. like, okay. And so I just start like slowly walking towards them. They let me get to like 20 yards before. They no way. To... Like I was out here six hours in the rain messing with these things. And I could have just probably walked right up to one shot it, threw it over my shoulder and left. And then when I, I left my bino harness at the tree uh, that I was like stalking these things behind, got back to the truck, loaded everything, realized I forgot my bino harness, went back. Well, in that time, the farmer had showed up and these things are following him around the barnyard, like just waiting to get fed, basically. So <laughs> it's, kind of, it's, it's totally weird. But then you get out of the eastern part of the state and those birds want nothing to do with you. They'll, they're so skittish and that kind of stuff. So it's all about, I guess, their temperament. But I think it's depending on where they're at and how interactive they are with people, it can be a whole different experience, but yeah, it's, it's a blast. Like you said, just getting a chance to hearing them gobble in the morning gets you fired up. It's like hearing that first elk bugle kind of thing, but I feel turkeys are a little bit better. Um, if you want a full blown interaction, maybe than an elk, elk's a little tougher to get close to when you got the For whole sure. herd of them. So yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. and so that's how it is in, in Southern Alberta and Southern South eastern bc is they're quite scarce so um they're they're really tough to hunt they're you know it's it's a lot different um because there aren't high concentrations of them there's small populations and it's not all over the place it's in just you know certain areas but um yeah so you know we're thinking of going to bc this spring but we can't quite make it so maybe next year we'll go in and do some turkeys i'll bring troy the turkey master with me he's been hunting them for you know over a decade so we'll give that a try maybe but um yeah so i wanted to chat about a few other things um you know you mentioned that you sort of work on the conservation side of things with tacticam and i was just curious what different uh programs do you guys find or where do you guys sort of put your conservation dollars at Tacticam? Yeah, the Tacticam team. And so what these, these guys have two primary things they get involved in. One is our conservation support program, which uh, we started up when I first got hired as well. Um, and then the other thing is our dealer support program. And so with the conservation piece, we support any organization that wants to fundraise basically at a banquet level, but we do all kinds of different, you know, raffles and things throughout the year, stuff like that. Typically, it's, it's uh, organizations that have banquets. If they've got a Tacticam there, we try to do our best to make sure that's manned with a Tacticam team member to run the raffle for the program, um, get out there, showcase the product, get people excited at the event so they spend more money on the products, and ultimately help them boost the profit that they make on uh, any Tacticam product that's there. And so for uh, national level partners with um, Whitetails Unlimited, uh, NWTF, uh, the Turkey Federation, we just got accepted for Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation's preferred vendor. Uh, we've worked with Mule Deer Foundation, Ducks Unlimited, Delta Waterfall. I mean, you name it. We've we've uh, been a part of what they do, whether it be a national level or something as simple as just one or two local banquets a year. Um, but yeah, really nothing's off the table. It's it's kind of our way to help make sure that these programs, we're doing our part to support these programs. Um, and I've got some future goals now that this has kind of been wrapped back under my hat after a few years out of that program um, to do some different things like internally at tax team as well. So we might do some things where there you can like round up for conservation there's some different programs and different companies that do that i'd like to maybe start something up like that um and then possibly even some things where our, our uh, employees and or our team members start doing more volunteer hours versus just the banquet side of things so um it's near and dear to all of our hearts at tacticam uh, i was a park ranger before so it's kind of a, a a pet project of mine i guess um but yeah it's it's this giant program uh in its height before covid um I think our best year, we just broke a little over a thousand events that we did in Mand. And um, I think the best year uh, dollar value raised wise was a little over half a million dollars um, in, in funds raised for conservation in, in a given year. Last year, banquets are just kind of starting to hit, you know, mainstream again with a lot of these organizations. I think we were right about $150,000 raised for conservation. So it's a, it's a big, big program. And um, we, we love being a part of it. Our volunteers love being a part of it. And it's something we're definitely looking to continue to grow go exactly okay so it's great to hear that tacticam gives back because you guys really have grown as a company um and it's and people recognize that you know i think i was talking with rudy um another employee at tacticam there about a year and a half ago and same thing he was telling me all the you know 
dollars that you guys have gave to these different organizations. So um, it's it's good to hear because not every company does that, but a company like yours growing, people are recognizing that. And um, yeah, no, it's it's really good to see. Now, one question I have, which has gotten brought up to me and, and other people before, and you see some of these different organizations um, now making some changes to um, some of the regulations regarding electronics, um, you know, cellular trail cameras, um, you know, archery sites with uh, range fighters on them and different things like that. Um, where do you guys sort of stand with ethics around electronics? And is there a line that can't let like, do you have a line that can't be crossed? Or, you know, what's the goal um, with electronics in uh in the hunting space. Now, essentially you guys are just working with cameras. So you aren't necessarily improving um, or giving more of an advantage to the hunter, but cellular cameras are becoming more controversial. Um, where do electronics have a part in hunting in your mind? Yeah, man, for sure. So uh, me personally, I, I'm, I'm kind of on the edge. Would I use some of these things personally? The answer is probably no, but do I have a, like a personal issue with, um, something that helps hunters be more efficient or help hunters, you know, make better shots or things like that. And I, I kind of got to answer it the same way. I don't really have an issue with it. Um, more of my thing is, uh, is a budgetary friendly thing. So when you're talking like archery sites that range fine and things like that, they're probably out of my personal budget. So <laughs> that's probably part of it, but do I think they're kind of neat and yet? Yeah, absolutely. I, do I understand the concept maybe on, a range finding site for, you know, let's say a state like Montana or uh, before the year that I moved here, um, we actually worked with uh, Montana's um, uh, fish wildlife parks and we've gotten their uh, blessing to get cameras as an exception to the rule of no electronics on archery equipment, which is really neat. Um, and, and our biggest argument with it across the board is that a video camera doesn't help you at all in the shot sequence, in the hunt, uh, be more efficient with the hunt. What it does do, similar to like maybe using a tracking dog to help find an animal you've wounded or whatever, it does give you the opportunity to go back, review your shot, um, things like that to make you help make a better recovery or maybe decide to pursue an animal right now versus let's wait, we have it overnight, you know, so those types of things. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about sharing the experience, uh, drawing attention to the sport, things like that, you know, at the end of the day with the camera. So we've worked with uh, a few different organizations. Uh, Montana, we got that written as an exception to the rule now um uh, washington as well and then uh, oregon we're kind of on the fence with idaho is like the one big holdout state here in the states anyway as far as you know blanket statements of no electronic um but as far as like i said personally i i tend to kind of stay out of those arguments i guess it's more of just uh for me it's do what you want range finding sites it, they base all the you know uh for hunting um tag limits and draw rates and things like that. It's all based around the, the success of what they anticipate the success of that season is going to be on the herd. So when you're talking something like an elk, they're banking that archery season for elk hunters, you know, we're going to anticipate a, a what, less than a 10% success rate. Well, if we have range finding sites and now someone can maybe, they know they, they know they can make a 90 yard shot, but with a fixed pin, it might be a little different. There's a whole different, you know, ball game. There are things like total archery challenge. We've got a whole wave of hunters out there now confident to 80, 90 yards, you know, or better in some cases, depending on what their equipment allows them to do. So if you up the amount of people who, you know, raise their confidence on what their shot could be, you might have somebody that normally wouldn't take a 60 yard shot, but because they know they can, they might. So what you might see like decreased, uh, I don't know, game, uh, game limits or, or tag limits, maybe things like that, or, uh, you know, opportunities, I guess. But flip side again, you know, things like a crossbow out in, you know, the Midwest or um, anywhere like that, is it actually going to be that much more effective than, than what an actual like compound bow is? I'd say possibly uh, again, having a scope gives you just a little bit more of a shot advantage, mm -hmm. knowing exactly where that's going to hit versus your arm shaking around, trying to hold a pin in one spot might be a little different, but you know, on the flip side, having it legal for archery up here in or firearm season up here in Montana, it's like, I don't, I believe the first guy to tell you, I don't want to carry a crossbow around hiking around the mountains. It's just, sounds like a pain in the butt to me. So I don't know. It's a, uh, it's kind of a toss up, but when it comes to electronics, man, it is, if you can use a range finder to know your distance and make a more ethical shot, I don't disagree with that. Um, range finding sites. I don't know. I, for me, it's more of a, I, I just personally want to use it and it's just kind of my own personal reasons, but it's not like I'm against it, I guess. 
So I mean, coming from a video camera standpoint, I love the idea that people can share their hunt. Like you said, have those memories. I've got my wife's first hunt on film and that's so, something that's so cool. I watched that video more than any other one I've ever filmed for myself. But, um, you know, cameras, I, I'd argue to the moon and back that they don't give you any kind of advantage and there should yeah. be an exception for those and that kind of thing. But, uh, technological advances and what we do, I don't know if it's necessarily leading to like major increases right now in success rates. And as long as that's kind of status quo and we all have opportunities to go out and hunt, I, I'm happy with it, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. You know, and my whole idea is we want to improve the overall hunting experience for people, you know, yeah. and yeah. if you have I like cellular cameras. I really like them. But now if you go a little bit west of us in BC, they can't use them. And Pope and Young has also announced that if you, you know, capture a photo of anything on a cellular camera, it can't be registered into their uh, their record book. You know, for me, I don't hunt to put stuff in the record books, but I do hunt to try and get the biggest bear I can or whatever I'm hunting. Um, but we utilize cell cams big time, especially with running our bear baits because we will have half a dozen of them and then we'll know, you know, when the bait's low, when it's high, um, are our success rates better since we've had those cameras? I would say they probably are, and it probably helps a bit for sure. Right. Because if yep. we didn't have them, um, we'd be heading out to those baits every three days, three, four days, checking them. We would still be checking our cameras, but it makes us a little more efficient in utilizing our time properly because we got we know where we got to go. Um, but the funny thing is the outfitters that I've hunted with for bears, none of them utilize cell cams because they're out there every single day checking all those baits anyways. Where someone like, you know, you or me who, you know, typically and most guys, you know, they'll work during the day and then they'll go spend their evenings to hunt or they'll take a couple of days off to go hunting. Um, you aren't necessarily, you know, checking those bear baits every single day or every second day like some outfitters are. So, um, you know, it's I hope we don't see any major changes with them because they are really nice to have. <laughs> they make yeah, things yeah. things good. And, you know, like I said, I'm all about improving the hunting experience. So we always try and bring a new hunter out with us each spring. And so if that means I can get that guy on a bear, um, you know, or get him to watch and see a few more bears rather than sitting in his butt in the stand and not seeing anything, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. there's a bit of an advantage to that. So yeah, you know, I just wanted to ask because, you know, the electronics thing, I don't have an issue with it. Um, I know, you know, some guys do because we hear it yeah. just with all the people that interact with our page. We always, anyone who has a negative thought, you know, they always seem to be the loudest in the group to, you know, <laughs> yell at oh, someone to say you're doing this wrong, doing that wrong, or you wouldn't have shot this without that, um, you know, and, and we don't. Yeah, as soon as we see those comments or anything, they get deleted and banned. We don't need any of that. And so we try and keep our pages as clean as possible. We have heard, you know, some of the issues people have with electronics in the past. And then I was quite surprised to see that Pope and Young um, just enacted that into uh, their regulations as well. But, you know, yeah. um, that's the way it is. Like I said, I don't hunt for them. I hunt for myself. But um, <laughs> exactly. yeah, you know, it is very nice having your hunts on film and getting that kill shot because every single time we release an arrow or, you know, a bullet at an animal, we always check that footage and then you oh, know yeah. where you shot. Hey, we got to give this thing overnight. You know what? We can probably go in 15 minutes and go track this thing. And that way, you know, right. Um, yeah. Owning the taxidermy shop here, I deal with hunters on a daily basis, right? So we'll have, 200 plus hunters come through the door each year. So, you know, I'm always talking with them. And, you know, the one thing that is quite common with most guys is I took the shot. I don't know where I hit. You know, I thought it was a good shot. I tracked that animal. I popped it out of its bed. I chased them all night, came back the next day, couldn't find them or the wolves got them, yada, yada. So oh, yeah. getting those kill shots on film, it is very nice to have because then you know whether or not you should, you know, pursue that animal after you shot it or give it some time or give it overnight or or whichever. But, yeah. um, you know, as or per, in, in, as oh. per increasing the odds of killing more animals or, you know, 
getting that animal easier. I don't think cameras are going to really help with that, but yeah. trail cameras, you know, now I know when the bears are hitting that bait, you know, I'm sitting at my, at my house. I see the bears there. I, I know there's a good chance he's going to be back tomorrow. So that helps a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I hope we don't see any major changes. And like you said, if they see success rates go way up with people utilizing these, then the tags will get adjusted accordingly. So yeah. I would rather see that than them pull and add more regulations in. But um, yeah, I was just curious sort of where you guys stood with that, just because that is, you know, your industry, your business is electronics in, in hunting. So I was yeah. curious, but um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I didn't even touch on the, I forgot that was part of the question, the reveal cameras that we have. So, you know, tax cams got the reveal cellular game cams. Um, you know, we, uh, coming from the Western, uh, sales position, uh, you know, when we started reveal, um, you know, cell cams in the Western part of the United States versus the Eastern part of the United States are just totally, it's a totally different ball game. Um, but, uh, there are States that have, or are increasing their, uh, you know, their restrictions on cellular cams in particular, we got Arizona, Utah, uh, New Mexico, I believe. And there's a couple other like lesser restricted places. And then you got a place like Montana where uh, you couldn't even leave a, you know, as soon as day one of hunting season started cellular or not, you had to go pull your game cams before. Well, now uh, they just lifted that restriction a little bit and said, you can actually leave them out year round. And the way the rules written is that it can't transmit real time data, which I interpret when I have mine going that that means like no cellular game cams out at that time, right? Because it does have the ability to transmit real time data. Um, but I've had uh, several of our tax cam team members live in different parts of the state that uh, talk with their local game wardens. And they say the way I interpret it is if you set your camera setting to only send pictures once every 12 hours, I that's not that. cool data, you know, because you're still 12 hours behind whatever that animal is doing. It gives you a general idea they're there, but you could have also walked into the woods and checked your trail camera 12 hours. So it's kind of a, a toss up. So it, it's kind of ebbing and flowing for sure. Um, but yeah, it seems like for whatever reason, there there are states that are definitely putting the clamp down on it. Um, you know, and that just is what it is. But again, you know, to me, do I agree or disagree with it being super successful? I think it, like you said, I totally agree. It makes you a more successful, more efficient hunter, I guess, putting your time in when it matters, when you might know that animal might be having the best chance of coming through based off of, data you've collected throughout the year from your couch, you know, while it's sending you pictures of what this deer or this bear is doing. Um, but you have one tag in your pocket or you got two tags in your pocket, right? So if you go out and, and harvest that animal because of the data you had, is that really that much different with the amount of fuel that you save, not having to drive back and forth and check cameras, uh, you know, with lithium ion batteries and everything else and solar panels, are those making cameras more efficient so you don't have to buy as many batteries and stuff. There's a lot of efficiencies that come with it that I think are kind of a good trade-off in my opinion, um, you know, of, of the normal game of, of the trail cameras, I guess. But I think they will make hunters more successful and I don't necessarily disagree. I don't think that that's a bad thing. Um, and I think you're, again, it kind of comes back to your tag limitations and the opportunities you're afforded. If you paid for your tag, do I want you to be successful as a hunter and fill that tag? The answer is yes. Um, you know, get out there, be successful with it. If it was because of a camera grade or if it was because you went and put the, the miles on your boots and figured it out the you know the other way. So I don't know. It's it definitely it, it I could see it getting more controversial, but I, I think it all comes down to the tag that you paid for that's in your pocket that funded our conservation programs. And as long as those conservation programs are doing their job, getting the better, you know, better harvest data and things like that. I don't know if it, I think it's kind of a wash. When yeah. It comes to yeah. And the huge benefit with cellular or trail cameras, period, too, is just the fact that you you have an idea of what's in the area. So if you have a guy running trail cameras and then you have another guy not running trail cameras, um, I would like to think that the guy who has a good idea of the critters in that area is more likely to harvest a more mature animal because he knows yeah. what's going to come through. He knows there's a great big bear in the area and he's going to wait for those little ones to pass. But if you have someone with not a lot of knowledge in the area, you know, who's maybe just cruising around, checking things out, they're more likely to shoot the first or second thing they see, right? Yeah. So we want those more mature animals removed. And then so those younger ones can breed and and get older. So, you know, I think yeah. there's a, a benefit there for sure as well. But um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think we covered that one. I was curious about that. Yeah. So we are for almost four months here into 2023. 
Um, what does Tacticam have coming down the pipe this year or even early next year? What can yeah, we expect for sure. or that you can share? You got a grin on your face, so I know you're holding something back. Oh, you have to at least input the grin to make people curious, right? So they keep looking. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, as far as this year, I think you're going to see a lot of technology side stuff. Um, like we're continuously developing our apps with the reveal side and the Tacticam side. We have the new uh, Tacticam Connect app, which is huge. It'll be able to, where we've previously had, you know, one for Tacticam, one for Spotter LR, one for Fisheye. Um, we're merging them all and it's called Tacticam Connect, the app. I'd say it's probably 70% of the way of, of where we want it to be. Um, some really cool things you'll see some development on there is it does have video editing features in it now. So you can actually edit your Tacticam videos right on your phone, which is a love and we've been asked that for so long. Um, that's going to get a lot of work done to it uh, to just keep making it easier and more efficient. Um, we'll be adding more of those camera lines into that app as well, where certain ones right now are still kind of on the fringe of being compatible. We're getting those compatibilities fixed. Um, so I'm really excited about that app and its capability. You'll see a lot of development there. Of course, Reveal, just being the monster that it is in the trail camera world, um, you're going to see a lot of efficiencies with our app on that. Um, we're doing a lot of cool uh, like loyalty program things as well. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, we've launched a few already. There's other ones that are coming fast on the pipe. They've got uh, people working hard every day on those. Um, so there's going to be a lot of really cool reasons if you're not a reveal user to maybe jump into the reveal, reveal side. If you are a reveal user, you're going to just have that much more uh, or that much better of a customer experience. So a lot of customer experience efficiencies and, and uh, upgrades, I'd say, to all across the board with all of our brands. Um, product wise, nothing new coming this year. Um, and we kind of like that philosophy with our tag cams. We're, we're on the sixth generation, but we're almost a decade in. So it's it's far from being, you know, launching a new camera every single year. And that's intentional. You know, we, there's only so much at the end of the day you can do with a point of view camera. We want to make it the best possible camera you can have, best user experience. But we don't want our customers or our dealers chasing the next best thing every single year. Or maybe saying, ah, I don't want to get into it now because I don't know what next year's going to bring. Um, and with the reveal side, that's something you see a lot of, especially in the trail camera industry, is every year there's this pressure to push out this new improved camera that maybe there's really not that much different from the previous generation that worked a little better or whatever. So our goal isn't to pump new stuff out into the market that doesn't need to be there. We're just going to continue to make our products better, more compatible across the board. Um, you may see some different uh, cool things that pop up where our cameras work with other systems now and things like that. But um, but yeah, just continue to improve on what we're doing now for uh, early 2024. I've got my fingers crossed that we might have some cool things coming down there on a, on a totally different camera line. Um, that's about as far as I can go with that one. But I'm, I'm really keeping my fingers crossed. It's something I've been excited about that we've talked about for several years now. And I'm really hoping 2024 is the year for that one. So be on the lookout for that. I think you're going to get a kick out of it. With what you're doing. Sweet. Well, yeah, the Tacticam 6.0, um, you know, it, it, it's been exceptional. We've loved it. Um, the Spotter LR, like you said, you released that a couple of years ago. But, hey, it's a 4K camera. It films great quality footage. So, you know, um, you don't really need to release something every single year. And, you know, I think the consumer sort of gets isn't a huge fan of that, right? Because you're buying a model this year and the next year there's another one and next year there's another one where if you got a great product and you guys, I'm sure the 6.0, you guys were working on that one years and years in advance to get it what it is today. Um, right. It's a camera that really is industry leading and there's Spotter LR, you know, we've dealt with some other brands or, or used years ago that had, you had to buy an attachment and it was just a major pain in the butt. You got to you know, filming with your phone on it, then you got a new phone, needed a new attachment, and it just didn't work good. You ran out of storage on your phone and it was nothing but a pain in the butt where this Spotter yeah. LR takes its own memory card. You know, it comes with all of the attachments. If you get a new spotting scope, if you're using your buddy's spotting scope, so, um, you know, you buy that and you don't need to buy anything else. So it really is a yeah. great camera. Um, now, the Tacticam FTS, that is designed to work with a 5.0 camera, right? Or will that, that won't work with a 6.0? It won't work with the 6.0. But okay. uh, so basically what we did is we took our 5.0 and our fisheye camera, we merged them in what's called the new Tacticam Solo Extreme. Okay. So that's actually keeps the same shape. It'll work with all the old uh, 5.0 mounts or any fisheye mounts you may have for fishing your shoulder mount, head mount, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that one, uh, it's, a, it's an awesome little camera. It's remote compatible which was cool. Our previous solo was not. So that's a, a big upgrade there. But yeah, for the FTS, that's going to be your camera for that. Um, and some improvements. The the one improvement I'm most excited about over the 5.0 on the solo extreme is the fact that this one's waterproof down to 30 feet, whereas the, the 5.0 series was rated weatherproof. 
Um, so anything elements are going to throw at it, you're not going to have to mess with. You could drop it in the water while you're duck hunting or fishing or whatever. The camera's going to be fine. But this one now, if you want to go spear fishing or do some things like that with it, you've got the ability. It'll withstand the pressures. Um, that's probably your biggest advantage um, over Solo Extreme or the five. But it's got a hell of a price point. It's at one ninety nine, so it's got a lot of bang for its buck at that price point. Yeah, super, yes. super cool. And the Tacticam Connect app, I love it. I love it. So I downloaded it. I was using the old version of the app. Um, and I downloaded the Tacticam Connect when I got the 6.0 cameras and I was super impressed with everything you could do on it. And like you said, now you'll be able to edit your videos on that as well. So that's another huge advantage. Um, yeah, man, we're excited for this year to get these things to work and, uh, and see what we catch for footage. It's, it's pretty exciting. Um, now you guys always release, you know, um, viewer videos and stuff like that from the consumer on your page. Is there anywhere people can send you guys footage if they capture, you know, a cool elk encounter or a bear or something like that? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I uh, go to our website, tacticam.com and there's uh, under the support tab, um, there's a contact button and under there. You can, there's a share your hunt option. You can click and you click that brings you to a video upload page. You can just drag and drop the file into the, the page there. Tell us a little more about who you are, what happened. Tell us a story, um, you know, what species it was, how you took it, what camera you're using, things like that. Um, and then we take those all the time. And we're constantly sharing them to our social media sites. Uh, and actually every single year um, for all of our uh, like point of purchase videos that you'll see on dealer displays in the stores or at trade shows, all the like sizzle reels we do, every single one of those videos comes from our customer content that we get sent. And we just kind of cherry pick the ones that we really like throughout the year, um, or ones that kind of highlight a new feature a little bit better or something like that. And we just compile them into this really cool video. So that's where all that content comes from. Super, super cool, man. <laughs> awesome. So you got some uh, spring turkey hunting coming up and uh, I'll be chasing bears. We'll catch back up with you in the summertime, maybe after your turkey hunts. We can talk about some fall hunting and uh, do that. Thank you so much for doing this with me today. Um, like I said, it's been a long time coming, so I'm thrilled that we got together to chat and just go over some of the, you know, new uh, products that you guys released earlier this year. And um, yeah, just get, you know, get to know you a little better and uh, talk hunting and, and everything else we chatted about. So I appreciate it big time. Yeah, absolutely, Brody. Anytime, man. And uh, we're stoked to be partnered with you. And I can't wait to see what those 6.0s push for you this year. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it. We'll catch back up with you in the summertime sometime. Thanks for doing this. Awesome. Absolutely, man. Great talking with you, Brody.